We are moving forward to our next session, that is rectal cancer. I would request uh, Professor Nagnath Babu to please join us as the moderator for the session. Good evening to one and all. Now we will begin uh, the panel discussion on rectal cancer. The topic is very straightforward. It's complete clinical response after new adjuvant therapy, what we do. So may I request our uh, esteemed panelists to come on the stage, Dr. Deepak Govil, the GA surgeon, Dr. Atul Samyam, oncosurgeon, Dr. Arna Gupta, oncosurgeon, Dr. Kaushik Satyaji, radiation oncologist, Dr. P. N. Mahapatra, medical oncologist, and Dr. Sururai Saudri, radiologist. So as you all know, the cancer rectum, the management has evolved from a monotherapy, a non-TME surgery, followed by uh, surgery and post-operative radiation, then came uh, neurogen chemo radiation, TME surgery. So now it's a trimodal therapy, is the standard modality of treatment with good outcome. But now because of the intensified uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, now the clinical response is picking up. Now the question is whether we should proceed with TME surgery or watch and put the patients under watch and wait program. So this discussion mostly will touch on watch and wait. So before that, I would like to ask the floor whether anybody has any experience in watch and wait management of cancer rectal patients. Surgeons. Thank you. So now to initiate the panel discussion, I'm just putting a clinical scenario of a patient managed in our department. So 45-year-old male patient presented with bleeding per rectum, altered bowel habits, and mucus discharge per rectum. And he was modeled in Aris and per abdomen, no findings. The rectal exam revealed a ulcerative proliferative lesion at 7 cm from the anal verge over the posterior wall. And biopsy was infiltrating, well differentiated, adenocarcinoma. And uh, CT scan was normal. MRI pelvis revealed a uh, mesorectal, I mean, fascia was not involved, but perirectal nodes were present. So, a clinical stage of T3, N2, M0 was made. And so, this comes under locally advanced cancer rectum. So the patient was put in the uh, MDT discussion and a decision was taken to give neurogen long course radiotherapy 50.4 gray with 5-FU and leak over it. So this was given and the thing was completed around 6 weeks. So after 7 weeks after completion, we did a rectal exam which did not reveal any lesion, palpable lesion. And the colonoscopy, there was no visible lesion, only a scar was seen and MRI revealed a complete regression. So this comes under technically a clinical complete response case. So now I would like to initiate the discussion. May I request uh, our panelist Dr. Deepak Govil. Uh, is these three modalities, the digital rectal examination and endoscopy and MRI is adequate for evaluation of a complete clinical response or should we do some other investigations? I think these modalities are the ones which are used for these uh, uh, for uh, identifying uh, clinical complete response. Uh, individually, they may not be uh, adequate to say that there is complete response, just one investment. But combined, all the three, it's almost 98% accurate that yes, uh, you are facing, uh, treating uh, uh, complete. Because two of these things are subject to the yeah. digital rectal exam and endos endoscopy, we see only the mucosal aspects. Yeah. Yeah. And rectal exam, we only feel. Yeah. So we don't know what is uh, actually happening. So MRI is okay, but this is only one objective evidence is there. Yeah. Is that enough or? MRI, yeah. I think these uh, three combined together, uh, if they all show these features, of clinical complete response. There are specific features on endoscopy, on MRI. MRI, there are some special cuts, which I think we'll be discussing. There are diffusion weighted images. If they also uh, are in, uh, uh, in sync with the uh, complete response, I think all these things, 
There is a talk about PET CT also in the literature, but it's not very well accepted as of now to say that this is uh, required to say that it is a complete response. I think combined these three modalities uh, itself should be sufficient. Yeah. So next question is, with these uh, investigations, can you classify the responses? Yeah, I think with these, uh, all these three responses, the digital, digital examination, endoscopy and MRI, there are grades uh, on which you can say that this is a clinical complete response or there's a near clinical complete response or there's an incomplete response. Depending on the grades, what you find on uh, rectal examination, on endoscopy, if there's a uh, small uh, telangiectasia or anything, that is a complete response. If there's a smooth nodularity, but there's a smooth wall, it's great uh, near complete response. But if there's a nodule uh, seen, yeah. then it is incomplete response. So you can grade these into complete response, near complete response, and incomplete response. So the literature says that the three the modalities of investigation, clinical and radiological, has accuracy of 98 percentage. But there are various uh, guidelines by different authors. According to that, uh, according to ESMO, you need to do a CEA evaluation as well as a uh, biopsy. And another uh, is, uh, this thing also says the need for biopsy. But by and large, biopsy is not required to establish the clinical complete response. So as uh, our panelists said, it can be a complete, near complete and incomplete depending upon the findings, endoscopy, rectal exam and the MRI. Is there any concordance between the CCR and PCR? Uh, uh, I think if it is not completely that all patients who have clinical complete response will lead to a pathological response, it's not seen it is only in almost 20% uh, of patients that it may be complete response is uh, uh, there are various studies which quote different percentages where uh, the complete response uh, is uh, related to pathological response. So there is no concordance between complete clinical response and uh, PCR. So all CCRs are not equal to PCR. So only a Haber gamma has shown the increased sensitivity and specificity of these three modalities uh, showing uh, a complete clinical response as well as pathological response, whereas other studies shows the specificity is only 16 percentage. Also, not all pathological complete response patients will have clinical response. Up to 15 percent can have near clinical response. So now we'll move on to point of discussion number two. So what is the role of biopsy? Now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Arnab Gupta. Because the patients Hello. worried, the surgeons Hello. worried whether it's really a complete clinical response or not a complete clinical response. Because we have to proceed the further management based on that. Uh, I do happen to have special interest in, in therapeutic endoscopy as well. So, well, I mean, if we see anything there, we will definitely biopsy. If it's only a scar, it may not be worth biopsying it. But any small nodule, any small ulcer, I will definitely do a biopsy on it. If it's a complete clinical response, normally you don't get to see anything, I will not do any biopsy. There's no yeah. point, you know, you can't do a random biopsy, it doesn't help. Any role for excision? Well, I mean, local excision? Local excision, if you can't see anything, you know, if you don't see anything it's at excision. all. Scar excision. We, uh, I don't have any first hand experience, but I don't think there's a role for that. So, exactly. The, there's no role for biopsy. Uh, generally, we don't do biopsy because it has got low negative or predictive value. The negative value does not rule out. Uh, uh, absence of uh, this thing and because of tumor fragmentation there is going to be sampling error. So also the nodes may not be able to be biopsied. So technically there is no role for biopsy in establishing the complete clinical response. Next we will move on to investigation the MRI and may I now request uh, Dr. Chaudhary to tell us about the role of MRI and its modifications, the role of endorectal ultrasound and whether there is any need for PET scan to establish CCR. So the role of MRI is not just to predict a complete pathological response, which clearly is very important. And uh, in the setting of, as, as already you have mentioned this already, that the two spheres, the Venn diagrams, are not exactly superimposed on each other. In fact, if anything, MRI or most investigating modalities undercall a complete pathological response. In other words, 
if we say that there is a, an, an incomplete response, more times there will be complete response on path than the other way around, although they are not completely mutually overlapping. But the role of MRI is beyond just predicting complete pathological response because it still tells you what the CRM is like. It still tells you what is the height of the tumor, so helps you to decide what sort of surgery you're going to offer. Are you going to offer, does the patient need an ELAP, for example? Does the patient need a prone AP, for example? So all of those things are, are also additional benefits of MR. So MR by itself, as you have already said, is not that good in predicting a complete pathological response. Various studies would report it between 50 to 65, 70 percent. So this is, I'm talking about T-staging. N-staging is even more unreliable. <clears throat> so uh, MR by itself is not, but in addition to clinical examination and colonoscopy, it is better. So uh, what can you do to improve this? You can do a few things. Of course, experience matters. and. Uh, and the visual appearance. So, for example, a polypoid tumor regression is better predicted by MRI than a circumferential tumor predict, uh, uh, downstaging. Second, what, what about sorry? Mm. What about the addition of endoscopic ultrasound I'm, to I'll, MR? I'll come to that. So, uh, the split scar sign, for example, you know, addition of dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, for example, addition of diffusion weighted imaging and 3D conformal diffusion weighted imaging, for example, tumor volume reduction by doing 3D morphology. So these are all additional things that can be added. But nevertheless, however much you add, you still cannot completely reliably predict complete pathological response. So that is about MR in general. EUS is actually very good, but it, the order of T-staging accuracy in, in restaging accuracy is of the order of 70, 75 percent, similar to MRI. Of course, further the tumor, more difficult it is with EUS. MRI gives you an overview. EUS gives you a problem solving, uh, you know, like if, if you think there's a very small tumor, you want to answer that with EUS, yes. But surprisingly, NCCN, even in this, this year's guidelines, don't mention EUS as a restaging tool. They say that MRI should be done only if there's a pacemaker, etc. EUS should be used. And to answer your last question about PET-CT, again, NCCN says PET-CT is not recommended. Clearly says, PET-CT is not recommended. Of course, we know that mucin secreting tumors is a problem with PET-CT. PET-CT should be used as a problem solving tool if you can't give contrast, for example, if you can't do MRI, for example, or if it is really equivocal on MRI, then you, you could do PET-CT. I think it is evolving, but nevertheless, as of today, we cannot recommend PET-CT as, uh, as a problem solving tool. Exactly. So, the MRI response can be complete as evidenced by the presence of uh, split scar sign and also near complete based on the tumor regression grading and uh, incomplete response. All these things can be well uh, made from the MR. So we follow the modified modern uh, this in classification which depending on the fibrosis we can find out the Regression. So the TRG response grades are not so much used nowadays, is that right? We use the three-stage yeah. uh, complete, incomplete and uh, yeah. So is there any role for MR modifications like uh, dynamic uh, contrast yeah. enhanced MR? So dynamic contrast enhanced MR assesses permeability, assesses vascularity, assesses cellularity. So uh, there are some studies, we used to do them, but we have actually stopped doing them because I mean we have ourselves looked at our data and we don't improve specificity that much, you know, by a few percentage points. What so, about PET MRI? No experience personally, I must say, but uh, potentially, yes, potentially, yes. But a very small uh, data sets, as you know, the randomized numbers are, uh, you put up all the studies, including the Mercury, extended Mercury trial and all that. So as of today, both in the UK and in India, our current practice is to use MR, but the use of MR is mainly okay to give you a guide as to whether there is a complete uh, clinical pathological response but more to do the other things that MR does well. So there is no role for endotracheal ultrasound because uh, post radiation there will be changes and we cannot differentiate the, all the layers that well because of the peritumeral inflammation. And also PET is more useful to de uh, detect the residual uh, tumor rather than to make the CCR. So next point of discussion is uh, what is the appropriate time of assessment of initial response of the chemoradiation? 
on the appropriate time is around 8 weeks where there are studies which has shown 8 to 12 weeks and longer you wait more the pathological response or the clinical response is there but the surgery become much more difficult because of the radiation fibrosis so first i assess at 8 weeks if i found there is near complete response i may wait for the another four weeks to assess the complete response otherwise if there is a residual disease i go for surgery at eight weeks the, the problem is initially there can be a near complete response which can become complete response for a period of few more weeks similarly a uh, initial complete response may not be sustained so the time is very very important and uh, various uh, studies shows different times haber gamma according to them is 10 weeks is the ideal uh, time for initial assessment. Mostly it is about 6 to 8 weeks, most of the studies reveal. So sustained response means the response should be from 10 weeks to up to 12 months. So the next point of discussion is what are the management options in this case of, uh, in my case of complete clinical response. Dr. Deepak Gobi. Will you operate? See, as of now, I haven't used this uh, regime, so my approach would be to go ahead with a uh, direct uh, yeah, resection, uh, that is a low anterior resection. And that would be my approach, but the literature is uh, showing that there is a possibility that you can consider uh, watch and wait policies in these patients. But in those patients, uh, the options which we have are that if there is a complete response, you uh, either uh, go in for a, uh, if there's a small uh, a near complete response then you can consider some local excisions also that is a possibility if you uh, go in for an operative approach but uh, non-operative approach if there's a near complete response you can give further chemotherapy like there is a role of total uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy in that you can give uh, consolidation chemotherapy the chemotherapy which is given before surgery can be either before the CRT that is induction chemotherapy but in these cases after complete response you can give it before surgery but after the CRT treatment that is called as consolidation chemotherapy. So the that is, is another option which you can Surgery non-surgical. Yeah. Surgery can be local excision or, or TME, uh, yeah, TME yeah, surgery. That's right. Okay. The next point is what is the role uh, of uh, TME uh, surgery uh, and what are the uh, advantages or disadvantages? Uh, that just I want to add. If you uh, patient is planned for wait and watch, they need to complete the adjuvant chemotherapy. Basically, whenever you have planned because it is a T3 N1 disease, so they all receive the four cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. And then we are going to discuss no. later our uh, chemotherapy soon. So, what is the role of TME surgery? Uh, well, I mean, I have to really counsel the patient and the family. If there is complete clinical response, to go ahead and do, a, especially if you are going to sacrifice the sphincter in a young uh, chap. I'd be very reluctant, so I would rather discuss with the patient and the family. If they're agreeable to close follow-up, I'll put them on close follow-up. But if they are kind of coming from a remote area, if it was initially quite an aggressive disease to start with, like poorly deficient adenocarcinoma with peridectal nodes, and if I can really preserve the sphincter in this sort of situation, I will go ahead and do a TME. That would be my kind of you know, approach to these patients. So the advantage is uh, by removing the organ, we can exactly find out the pathological complete response also. We can predict the local and systemic recurrences. And patient also will get satisfied that the tumor has been removed from the body and we can plan the adjuvant therapy also. But what about the QOL issues? This is a very major issue uh, in anti-resection APR because these patients will develop almost 50% uh, of them will develop urinary bowel and sexual dysfunctions. Almost up to 90% can develop uh, anti-resection syndrome and most of these patients will end up in either uh, temporary or permanent uh, stomas and because of this uh, morbid, uh, morbidity there can be a delay in initiation of adjuvant therapy. Mm, yes, apart from all this we can also have the low anti-resection syndrome which syndrome. is not yeah. able to hold the you know, bowel stool and the gas so that's another major issue. So especially in elderly people with uh, loose sphincter and if it's going to be really, really ultra low uh, that's going to be a major issue and then obviously we have to take all this into consideration like I said. So evidence in the literature also the, um, regarding the quality of life, the watch and wait scores over the TME in terms of the functional outcome. So almost all the scoring system, the, according to them, watch and wait is better than TME. So next point of discussion is um, what is the role of watch and wait? Now we uh, discuss about TME. 
So, Dr. Atul. Yeah, it's very selected patient we can offer, especially when there is a sphincter involved when the patient is planned for APS if we are going for surgery. So, very selected. First, we have to discuss an MDT. Second thing, patient should be highly motivated for the closed surveillance. And number three, we have a all complete clinical response based on the MRI, DA and endoscopy. And if patient is highly motivated, discuss an MDT, yes, it can be offered, but it is not a standard of care. So, we have to offer only in selected patient on the individual basis. If you see the number of uh, all these uh, factors, the pain control and uh, being cured of disease, not having permanent stoma, most of the patients, they choose this. They don't want to have a permanent stoma. So, that scores uh, better than being cured of cancer. So, stoma is really uh, people they don't like. So, next uh, point of discussion is, uh, if you have decided to uh, initiate the watch and wait management, what are the prerequisites you said? What are the surveillance protocols? Well, Dr. Mm, yeah, I think like I said, uh, like we all agreed, uh, assessment at the end of six to eight weeks from the time of completion of chemo radiation is obviously going to be there. And then the next uh, follow-up should be at 12 week, and then between 16 to 28 weeks, which is normally recommended by most of the studies. And then, like we all agreed to, uh, digital examination, uh, proctoscopy examination, or put, putting a flexible scope and MRI. Those combinations have to be there. And the follow-up should go on till 12 uh, months very you know, uh, rigorously. After 12 months, we can slow down a bit. Maybe every three, four months, we need to see the patient for the next two years, and then maybe every year. And then CE has to be followed up as well. So it be lifelong follow-up or? Uh, At least five years for sure. Most of the cancer patients, we must all accept that we put them on a long-term follow-up. Yeah, exactly. So the intensification follow-up, that is uh, follow-up should be more intense during the first two years. And then we can reduce the frequency if there's no change. So uh, according to Habergama, the follow-up uh, includes every, I mean, uh, clinical examination, rectal exam and CA evaluation, endoscopy every once in two months during the first year and then every three months during the second year and then every six months from the third year onwards. So whether we should follow up lifelong or up to ten years, now I think we can uh, follow up till five years and then selective follow up is needed. So next point of discussion is what are the disadvantages and difficulties in watch and wait management? Dr. Uh, Deepak. Like, uh, for disadvantages, I think uh, main thing is there's a lot of uh, the data is very heterogeneous. Like the people, uh, the uh, schedules of chemotherapy and radiation are different in the various studies which have shown uh, watch and wait policies. Another, um, the most important thing which is a hindrance, at least to me, is a strict surveillance protocol. In our country, I think that is one area because I heard one of the Hypergamma's uh, team people speaking. And they said they almost are wedded to the patient for two years at least. Like if there's a small problem, they will come. Otherwise, uh, they will go to them. So it's a very close contact with them for two years. That is very important in these patients. So in is our, in yeah, it, yeah. I think in our country, that is very important because if things keep going smoothly, everything is fine. If there's a recurrence, nobody is willing to accept. Yeah. So more than that, uh, financial load is also more yeah, and there is also is. lack of insurance for repeated uh, investigations. So now we have International Watch and Wait Registry which was established in 2014. It consists of both retrospective as well as prospective data from 2015. And uh, so over a period of years, definitely we will get a robust data regarding the watch and wait uh, management. So the current status according to NCCN in those patients who achieve a uh, CCR with no evidence of residual disease on digital rectal examination, rectal MRI and direct endoscopic evaluation, a watch and wait non-operative management approach may be considered in centers with experienced multidisciplinary teams. The degree to which lo uh, risk of local or distant failure may be increased relative to standard surgical resection has not yet been adequately characterized. So decisions for non-operative management should involve a careful discussion with the patient of his or her uh, risk tolerance. So now we have got a lot of uh, studies going on, including randomized study which are recruiting the patients. So in another few years, we'll get good data. So the current challenge is to achieve a balance between improving the quality of life and reducing the risk of distant meds and improving the survival. So 
The one important complication after this uh, watch and wait is the development of local regrowth. So how to manage that? Dr. Deepak. Yeah. Actually, uh, practically, I feel if there are local re uh, regrowths, I would be uh, aggressive in those and uh, go ahead with a TME in such situations, preferably. But uh, the literature shows that even local treatments and uh, surveillance, continued surveillance may be tried in these patients. So the risk of local regrowth is more in the first two years. After that, the chance is less. If the local regrowth occurs, it occurs only over the mucosa, endoluminal, which can be resect, uh, lo uh, which can be managed by local excision or by TME surgery. I would, uh, I, uh, I would defer here. I would like to have a TME, as Dr. Govil said. The reason is it is a local recurrence. Again, it is an aggressive disease once it recurs. So if it is recurring early, it is better option to go for TME rather than local excision and again try the patient for the wait and watch observation for another two years. So be better to have a TME, proper surgery. But literature is the oncological outcome is same for stage as well as the direct TME. Surgery. But there is also some evidence to say that in these early recurrences, there is also a 15% risk of nodal disease. So that is also something important in terms of uh, local treatment. So, yeah, apart from, you know, what he said, we all kind of are very reluctant to do a local excision. I don't have any personal experience. But if you go by the principle of, you know, oncology, you know, for breast, it's fine if you do a local excision. But we had burnt our fingers doing, you know, low anterior resection going by the new margin. So it says that, you know, if you have to stick to the margin, go by the original margin. So if you, even if it regresses, there's a good chance there will be actually a positive, you know, my, uh, microscopy margin when you do a, res a resection. So TME is better than local excision? Uh, I think in, in Indian experience, I would. So what of the role of radiation therapy in complete clinical response, Dr. Kaush? Actually, after you achieve complete clinical response, the role of uh, radiotherapy only comes in is when the surgeon feels that it cannot be, uh, a TME is not feasible or when a local resection is not feasible. Then somebody might refer us the case for some kind of re neoadjuvant therapy, which is almost negligible evidence on that because repeat, repeated radiotherapy to that zone is literally impossible, say within the first two years. After that, you might give it a shot, but the small bubble toxicities, the bladder toxicities would be sky high and that has to be thoroughly discussed with the patient. So if the patient is having a regrowth, we wish to God that the recurrence should be resectable. Otherwise, my role pops in. Thank you. So what is the uh, role of radiation dose escalation in uh, achieving the complete clinical response? So overall, there is, there is currently no role for clinical dose escalation because… Any uh, role for brachytherapy? Sir, so there selective cases. in very selective cases, we can do interstitial brachytherapy, but uh, I would once again say the, the evidence is there that brachytherapy can be done for a, a completely superficial and mucosal recurrences. Okay. So it can be selectively used? No, it is uh, intraluminal brachytherapy can be used provided the depth of the tumor is within 5 millimeter from the, uh, from the mucosa. And the complication is going to be a severe proctitis. Sir, severe severe proctitis. So now we'll move on to chemotherapy in complete clinical response, Dr. Mahapadra. So what are the chemotherapy regimens available to improve the complete clinical response? Role of TNT, including injection and consolidation chemotherapy and supporting trials. See, we have uh, the two trials actually, the Prodis 22 trial actually, that is the uh, friends trial. They have be used Folfoinox actually as a neoadjuvant chemotherapy and after that uh, chemo radiation then and adjuvant Folflux. We have Rapido trial actually, that is the trial where uh, they were given a short course uh, radiation and consultation chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy and consultation chemotherapy. So usually what uh, if somebody we use mainly either Folflux or capacitive and auxiliary based chemotherapy. Will be, with time I think will be more comfortable using chemotherapy, neoadjuvant than adjuvant actually, maybe. And uh, So what do you think, consolidation is better or induction chemotherapy is better? Naturally See, there uh, is, a, as you know, there is a lot of uh, actually controversy about the new consolidation chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But if you see the outcomes actually, outcomes are same. 
but if you see the uh, complete response rate that will be more in the consolidation arm because of the length of the uh, treatment duration from radiation to the chemotherapy because after that chemotherapy is given. So the length is more, you give short course, you give a long course, you take more time, you will get more PCR. So now we have the evidence uh, for three years follow up of these three important, I mean four important trials which shows consolidation chemotherapy is better than induction chemotherapy. And in OPRA trial, the organ preservation regular adenocarcinoma trial, the organ preservation is better with consolidation, 58% compared to 43% for the induction. So is there any role for de-escalation of uh, therapy? Can radiotherapy be avoided in selected cases, Dr. Actually, yeah. sir, now th there is a lot of de-escalation trial. You give neurogen chemotherapy, you see the response actually. Or you give chemo radiation and neurogen, you see if somebody is responding well, you can decrease the radiation from 50.4 gray to 45 gray. Or if somebody is responding totally, you can have a local resection. That is not negative patients. Can you avoid radiotherapy at all? That is, there is a trial, a neo trial actually. They actually, this is a not negative patient. So you give full flux chemotherapy, you see the response. If the response is there, you can do a local surgery. You can avoid the radiation in those patients. Thank you. So now, what of the role of biomarkers in selecting the appropriate uh, treatment and to improve the CCR? See, sir, one thing is actually now a lot of hype because of Dostalamab is uh, the uh, MSI status actually. This, uh, there are 5 to 10 percent of the patients who will be MSI unstable and they are very hot tumors actually. And uh, we know from the metastatic disease also any immunotherapy you give, they have a good uh, result in this type of patients. So this type of patient can be treated with the immunotherapy. Now do we have a little bit evidence with dostalumab with 20 patients. We have uh, evidence with nibulumab, bipulumab, or nibulumab uh, with small trials actually. And another second is actually the uh, uh, immune, immune environment actually. The immune environment or uh, the, the, that is actually if somebody is immune hot, they respond to immunotherapy but the, and their uh, response to chemo, uh, chemotherapy and uh, radiation will be more. So you can select such cases and give these treatments. So this is actually going on. Some, some trials are there, RAS mutant patient may do well, they may be more PCR like that. So we will come to the last question. So what is the role of artificial intelligence in predicting PCR from CCR? Dr. Saudhiri. So before I just, I, I won't take more than 30 seconds. So just one word, I think you mentioned radiomics as well. Just for people who are not uh, aware of the term, what radiomics is. Radiomics is basically a computational method of understanding parameters which are actually there on the image, which is not visible normally to you and me, which a highly intelligent, uh, you know, looking platform can analyze. So it involves things like heterogeneity, uh, you know, a lot of things. So there are morphological features like speculation, like vascularity, like increased uh, vascular invasion, etc., which we report, right? And, but there are agnostic features which we don't report and we don't see. So radiomics involves these. And what artificial intelligence does is actually this is, these are such large data to do this manually, to segment this manually, to get this is very difficult. So AI helps you. So for example, if you look at a tumor, you can you can cut out the tumor, then what AI and radiomics will do is identify the tumor edge and the tumor core and based on certain characteristics it can tell you that… No, with reference to CCR and PCR I'm asking. So I'm, I'm saying, so by judging the tumor core and the tumor edge, there are further characteristics which we don't see which correlate with CCR and PCR better than what you and I can see and report. So it is… It is a hot topic if you look at our European Radiology Journal that, you know, 10, 10 articles every month on, on, on this. It's going to be the feature. Yes. We'll be getting a lot of articles. Yeah. Thank you. So, any queries from the floor? So, the cancer rectal management has evolved from monotherapy to trimodal therapy can and I now back to, uh, is coming back to uh, monotherapy. There can is I, a, can I ask a question? I mean, okay. I just wanted to ask anybody in the hall whether they have got experience in local excision because that's something 
you know, is there in the literature whether, you know, it's really worth doing it, whether you got… So I'll speak on behalf of Birmingham Cancer MDT, not from my experience in India, one of the largest centers for local tumor excision. So in excess of 450 local excisions done by three surgeons, they only do that, <laughs> they, do. they don't do other things. Uh, it is associated with uh, a very close MR follow-up, like you said, first two years quite intense follow-up and then gradually and endoscopic follow-up uh, and clinical follow-up. They report absolutely excellent results. But to be honest with you, you require a solid pathologist, you require a very good radiology team, you require… So the surgery is there, but the pathology doing the Hackett levels, doing the, you know, t telling you what is the submucosal extension to great detail is required. So it's a multidisciplinary team. They do a frozen on table. Uh, they do a frozen on table, yes. Yeah. So I'm sure this watch and weight management will pick up in India once we get a good number of data. So we need to have an Indian registry for that and slowly we can build up our data. Maybe in the future this will come into oh. So uh, I thank all the panelists and the delegates for the patient hearing. So I think question. we had a good discussion on watch and wait management. CC. One question, sir. Yeah. We often find patients who have not received neoadjuvant chemo radiation for locally advanced rectal cancers in non-oncology hospitals. They have received six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a CCR, how should they be managed? No, it can happen, that's what I'm telling. So future, the, uh, this thing also may, the de-escalation I spoke, no? The aggressive chemotherapy can be useful. But it's not the standard of care, no? Now it's only neoadjuvant chemo radiation. Maybe in the future, when aggressive it, therapy… It just goes on to show that a surgical meeting has put this as a topic and I applaud this because in, in, in keeping with what med physicians do, they keep trying to get themselves out of work. So, uh, so, so you know, it's a, it's a discussion that is going on in a surgical conference and this is something that one has to applaud. Actually, there is a Chinese style. Actually, you give fall flux, you give radiation with fall flux and only chemo radiation. And the long-term outcome are same. Actually, if you give fall flux and you do money, the long-term outcome are same. Actually, overall survival is same. But uh, PCR rates are differ. So I think this will fall into opera trial. I mean, that's what they have started with. Induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation and then surgery. So this could go into actually the opera trial. But sir, that should not be the standard of care. Actually, chemo radiation is… No, that's what I'm saying. But now for this patient who has already had chemotherapy, you can't change the treatment plan right now, so I think yeah. might as well give chemo radiation and then operation if there's a residual disease, obviously. Thank you. Thank you.